Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here this morning, and I hope you've had a joyous journey on the way in. Uh, right, our call to worship this morning. This is the place, this is the time. Here and now, God waits. He waits to break into our experience, to change our minds, to change our lives, to change our ways, to make us see the world and the whole of life in a new light, to fill us with hope, joy and certainty for the future. This is the place, as are all places. This is the time, as are all times. Here and now, let us praise God. And I'm going to sing a song to you. But please do feel free to hum along <coughs> quietly. You can clap, you know, shall we? <laughs> we are praising God this morning. Strength will rise as we wait upon as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, our God. Lord, we want to give you thanks and praise this morning as we come into this place to worship you. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you give upon us, those that we recognise and sometimes, Lord, those that we don't. But we know that all good things come from you. So, Lord God, in this building used to the sound of singing in better times, where there have been baptisms and funerals, where people have come to be married and to celebrate the birth of a child, this building, where some have wept and some been filled with joy, where people have struggled with the deep things of life, have prayed urgently, been stirred and changed. In this building, where you have so often been with your people, be with us now, we pray. Amen. Amen. Just a few notices. Uh, firstly, the offering basket is out by the door on your way out because we won't be passing it around the church. Um, but of course, we don't let you go empty-handed. So as you empty your hands into the offering basket, uh, Dorothy has kindly got us a load of BMS prayer guides, which are on the left 
Um, so please do pick up one of those. It's a prayer guide which takes you through the month of all the issues and things which uh, they would like prayer for. So please do pick one up. Um, they're, not worth, they're useless at the back on the round. So please do take one as you leave. Uh, and if they're all gone, don't panic. The same prayer guide is available on the BMS website. So please do take one as you go. Um, also, tomorrow, we're open for prayer from 2 to 4. So please do, uh, if you've got a few moments, spend time and come and sit in the Lord's presence and listen to him. Uh, Eva is going to be doing Jam Club again after school. That is going really well at the moment. Um, we just need to drum up some support because uh, at the moment she's doing it on her own. So uh, uh, I will be talking to some of the people to help Eva. Uh, and also, Friday, stay and play. Oh, that was amazing, wasn't it? We had 10 adults um, and loads of kids. There must have been another 10 kids. It, it was humming, I have to say, and it was really good. So please continue to pray for stay and play. Um, the Lord is obviously moving in that. And a lot of new people coming uh, as they're new to the village and trying to seek friendships. So please do that. And also, afterwards, um, the lunch club in the school, uh, which ever goes on to do. Uh, again, that is, that is going really well and beginning to grow. So praise God for that. Next Sunday, you have the pleasure of John bringing God's word, who's going to continue on with the letters um, to the churches in um, Revelation. And also next week, it is our AGM. So um, there are agendas at the back. If you want to take them away and read through them, please pray through it too. Uh, hopefully we'll be distributing probably via email the church accounts which have been independently examined in time for the meetings that's fantastic um, again we'll send that around before the meeting so if you've got any questions you can bring them in come on in Barry there's the seat at the back thanks so those are the notices AGM next week uh, please do pray about that and those that are nominated Nigel is re-standing so please do pray for him, because he's going to need it. <laughs> busy year this year. But not only is it a busy year this year, it's a busy week this week, because we've got some birthdays. Haven't we, Shelley? <laughs> you couldn't possibly say. Because not only is it yours, it's also Cleo's. <laughs> uh, and not only is it yours and Cleo's, but it's also Jackie's, who was baptised the other week. Her birthday today, too. So it's a busy one, um, and it's also my... My, my um, stepson-in-law, it's his birthday too. So it's all go today, isn't it? So um, you can hum again while I sing happy birthday. Or you can clap. Happy birthday to you. Bless you, Shirley and Cleo. I do have a card for you here, but I won't walk through just yet with it. Don't go over home without it. Not that it's got any money in or anything, but... <laughs> We're going to uh, watch a video, which is from our regional team leader, um, Colin, who's just got a few words he likes to say to us. A warm greetings to you from me, Colin, and the Southern Counties Baptist Association staff team. We are still living in the goodness as a family of the wedding celebration of our daughter Lucy to Josh. We were just simply glad that it could go ahead and we had the restrictions of 15 people for the wedding and 15 people for the reception and the reception had to be outdoors so it was in an open-sided marquee in the grounds of the hotel that we booked long ago for the celebration day. Some while ago we decided that if the wedding could take place we would simply make the most of whatever it was that we could, we could do 
however we could be on the day and um, we were gonna we were gonna just celebrate whatever happened and make it a brilliant day for Lucy and Josh and all of us as we gathered. And that was a different sort of approach to one that had begun to dominate for us, which is what we couldn't do and who couldn't be there and uh, how we weren't able to celebrate and uh, the fact that we couldn't sing or uh, dance or all of those different things that one that one begins to, to, to build up and concentrate on and let dominate. And it's reminded me, as I've reflected, on this contrast between feeling that there's lots that we can't do and aren't, uh, haven't got the resources for or the people that we can't be with. And that's totally understandable and been a dominant theme during the whole of this pandemic time. And then another approach, which is um, the one that says, well, what is it that you can do and have got and are gifts and you can make the most of and who you can be with in whatever way you choose or are able to be with them? Those two contrasting sort of uh, trends and themes that we have in our own uh, hearts, but also as we talk with uh, with other people as well. And I find it, uh, both, both things are found in the wedding at Cana story in John 2, which I want to make a few connections with. The first is the naming of the scarcity, and uh, it's Mary who does that in John 2. And uh, with the bold comment, we're already told that the wine has run out, with a bold comment, comment to Jesus, uh, there is no more wine. There is no more wine. And what I like about it is that once Jesus has had his own reaction, as he presumably prayerfully <laughs> thinks about what is being offered to him as a problem. What I like about it is that Mary doesn't give the solution. I do actually wonder what it is she thought might happen. Did she think that Jesus was organised um, uh, some people with donkeys to go to the nearest place that might have some supplies? Did she think that Jesus would assert his authority and say to people that the uh, celebration would have to come to a premature end? Did she think that he would organise a rationing system for what was still left? Did she think that he would take some personal responsibility and get himself and his disciples out of the way because they presumably had added to the extra pressure on the guest list and the wine that was available? Well, she only does one thing, which is she says to the servants, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. There's something absolutely vital about when we name the scarcity, when we acknowledge what we miss or what we haven't got or what we can't do. There's something vital about also not wanting immediately to find a solution, unless, of course, it's an emergency situation. She just tells Jesus and then she presumably walks away and leaves it with him. She'll benefit later from what Jesus does do, but in the meantime, she's not on the scene, at least the way John tells it. So something about us also being able to name our scarcity and what we feel we haven't got and who we're not able to be with, or perhaps who we haven't got in our church, what we haven't got in terms of our resources, all of those things, uh, it's right and proper that we get to name them. But there's a second aspect as well, which is when we've expressed our need or the scarcity, trusting and being willing to receive and make the most of the gift that Jesus does give, of the gifts that Jesus does make available. What I notice here is that Actually, this wedding uh, shifts into another gear as this vintage wine is rolled out around the reception. And what Jesus does is he, he affirms and underscores the importance of this wedding celebration. Of course, he protects the social embarrassment of the bridegroom, uh, who would have been the one that faced, uh, as it were, the uh, 
mutterings of the neighbours and the local village. But he enables the celebration to continue, not least because, and John's going to tell us this in several ways, not least because the world is headed for a wedding. John tells us this is the premier sign, it's the first sign, it, it's the one that underscores and uh, um, uh, uh, is the end, end game, as it were, of everything that Jesus brings and is going to be doing. The world is heading for a wedding. Revelation 21 tells us that, that actually there'll be a bride and uh, God matched and joined together and uh, the mourning and the crying and the struggling and death are all finished and all things are going to be made new. It's also here in John's uh, account because he tells us it's the third day. Well, actually, if you do the math, it's the, it's the fourth day, but actually it's the third day poetically at least. Um, and I'm sure there's some other explanation, but, but you know, the third day reminds us of resurrection life. The first big sign, there'll be healings and of course Lazarus will be raised from the dead There'll be other sorts of signs, but this is the premier one. And it reminds us that uh, although we are not to, as it were, take this as the formula for living, this is a special occasion signalling a special vision, still it is that actually God is the one that we come to when the scarcity and we receive the gifts that he gives to us. We know that this isn't the formula for how we should normally behave because when people sought Jesus because he'd fed, fed them on the hillside after a long day's teaching, uh, Jesus gives them short shrift and he says to them, actually, you, you're only here because I fed you, because I gave you the bread. So it's not a formula, but it is actually part of one of the great signs of what God is doing. So as well as naming to Jesus where we sense lack, and scarcity and uh, sadness about that and also need for him to provide what would it be like if uh, with Mary we don't tell Jesus how he's supposed to respond to that but we do receive whatever gift he brings one of the gifts we had in this uh, lovely wedding celebration that we had totally beyond our control was it just was a very very sunny beautiful day and we hadn't had many like that and in fact, we'd had to book a heater because elderly grandparents uh, don't cope well with open sided marquees. Um, but we didn't need to use it at all. So just a lovely providential gift from God of a beautiful day. And of course, we made the most of that by being outside a lot of the time, not just in the marquee. What are the gifts? What is the gift that God is giving to you and to you as a church? Or is it that he's already given something that you are not noticing? People, some sort of resources, some connections with your community as you want to help others to come to know and love Christ and certainly to receive his love for themselves. So hopefully some, um, some simple thoughts, but they're about how we might at this time, as we're waiting for everything to sort of shift into a different way of being together, with great thankfulness, by the way, uh, some thoughts about um, decision making over the next few days and few weeks and few months. Yes, naming where there's something we haven't got or are not able to do, but also trusting and looking out for the gift and the gifts that God is bringing about, who we have got, who we are connected with, what we can do, and then making and then making the most of them. May God bless you as you do that. Amen. Something to reflect upon, don't you think? We're going to come into a time of prayer, but uh, as we do this, we're going to hear a song, uh, Endless Hallelujahs.
When I stand before your throne, dressed in glory, not my own, what a joy I sing of on that day. No more tears or broken dreams, forgotten is the minor key. Everything as it was meant to be. And we will worship, worship forever in the presence. We will sing, we will worship, worship you, and it was hallelujah to the King.
come to a time of praise worship and prayer through prayer but before we do just some news from india um you know we've been praying for pastor paul this week who lost his second eldest brother his other brother jacob was admitted to hospital um but he has now been released uh, with treatment he's still not well but obviously they've released him so we'll pray the lord continues uh, to make him stronger and get him through this uh, and thankfully all the children are well on the mend uh, so we praise god for his uh, mercy there um, but do please continue to pray for India as a whole because it's a horrid situation um, and uh, yeah they will need our prayers at this time so we're going to come into a time of prayer and uh, we you can pray as the Lord leads um, but I'll open the press let's pray creator God maker of all that is in creation we see the glorious outworking of your imagination Every creature through your life-giving spirit is spoken into existence and loved into eternity. For the gift of life, we praise and thank you. Generous God, giver of all good things, in your Son we see the wonder and the cost of love. In his living and dying, we feel your compassion and we see your purpose. In his glorious resurrection, we know death not only as endings, but as beginnings. For the promise of life eternal, we praise and thank you, O Lord. Amen. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the scientists and all the health workers that have continued to push out this vaccine rollout. We praise you, Lord, that we can see light at the end of the tunnel and a return to, to closer fellowship than we've endured the past 12 months. So we pray, Lord, your blessing upon all those involved in this rollout and for all those in frontline care who have worked tirelessly in the last 12 months. May they know their value and their worth. May they be strengthened each day to continue their duties. And Lord, bless them in their service, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for all the others that service in communities in different ways. Perhaps those that we can recognise and those that we don't. And yet, as they serve us, Lord, it makes our lives better and more wholesome. And we continue to pray for them, Lord. We pray for the newly elected leaders in our local and, and uh, governments and county councils. Lord, we just pray that they would always put other people first that despite politics, Lord, they will always seek to do the right thing, be fair and just, and fulfil their promises of the election. And as we turn to our own election next week, Lord, we just pray that you will guide us through the AGM, that you'll help us to discern your will for this place. And as... Chris Norris said this morning, Lord, we don't look at what we don't have, but we look at what we do have and how you have blessed us here so richly in the years. So, Lord, we want to give you thanks and praise this morning. We want to lift your name on high because your name is above all other names and it is you that we praise and worship today through and in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Father God, you gave your only Son because you loved the world so much. We pray for the peace of the world. We continue to think of those places where war is still raging. And although it's not in the news at the moment, it is still carrying on. We think of Yemen. The violence recently breaking out in Jerusalem. We think of the persecution of those in North Korea and China. Move among us by your spirit. Break down barriers of fear, suspicion and hatred. And heal us of our divisions. And unite us in the bonds of justice and peace. 
We pray for our own country. Enrich our common life and strengthen the forces of truth and goodness. And teach us to share the prosperity that we have. That those whose lives are impoverished may pass from need and despair into dignity and joy. We pray for those who suffer. Surround them with your love, support them with your strength, console them with your comfort, and give them hope and courage beyond themselves. And if there is practically anything we can do, Lord, stir us into action. We pray for our families, for those whom we love. Protect them at home. Support them in times of difficulty and anxiety, that they may grow together in mutual love and understanding and rest content in one another. And we pray for the church. Keep her true to the gospel and focused on your mission and responsive to the gifts and the needs of all. Make known your saving power in Jesus Christ by the witness of her faith, her worship, and her life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we say together the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we do thank you for feeding us. And as we turn to your word now, Lord, we pray that you feed us once more with words of righteousness, and instructions on how to live lives that bring you glory. So help us to understand and live it out through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, just a, a bit of an announcement that this isn't the, uh, the advertised programme. So uh, I'm just stepping in at the moment. But I want you to turn, if you can, in your Bibles to John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. And this is one of my favourite um, passages, because it's got Nick in it. Good old Nick. That's Nicodemus. John 3, verses 1 to 21. Now, Nick seems to get quite a bit of a bad press, but he is a guy that was really searching. He'd heard about Jesus and the signs and wonders, and he knew that Jesus was speaking with authority. But he didn't just sit on the sidelines. He wanted to know more. But because he was so high up in the Jewish leadership, it's not something he wanted to do publicly. So he came to Jesus one night. Reading from verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. You cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with every one born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus said? 
You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he had not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So this morning I thought I'd do a a quick break um, from Revelation because John's carrying that on next week. And I thought because of where we are as a church in, in, in in our walk of faith together... I'm going to mention the E word once more. And I know it's a word that makes most Christians uncomfortable. It makes them feel like they do when they hear words like root canal treatment, (laughs) or income tax returns, or tithing. It means, for many believers, the word evangelism conjures up feelings of guilt, fear, or inadequacy. It brings to mind those awkward conversations and strained relationships. And for this reason, many Christians shy away from Matthew 28's Great Commission and they pass the book to the minister. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, it's not just me. The sad truth is that most Christians never reproduce themselves spiritually. They never lead another person to faith in Jesus. And that is a shame. And people who aren't Christians don't feel much better about evangelism than we do. In his book, Unchristian, David Kinnaman interviewed hundreds of young adults on their perceptions and experiences of Christianity. And when it came to the subject of evangelism, the overwhelming response was, negative. (laughs) The young folk told him that they felt buttonholed, bullied and manipulated and only one third of them felt that Christians in their lives really cared for them. The rest said they felt like they were someone's project. But evangelism is a team thing. We're called to play our part in sowing seeds nurturing and guiding and in that wonderful blessing of harvesting you see when a person comes to faith in christ it is usually the result of a chain of christian friends each doing their part to treat this person well like a person not a project and in this way the person moves closer and closer to the point where they decide to follow jesus So here is the issue for today. How can we share the good news of the gospel so that it is less of a negative experience for all involved? What do we need to do in our part to be effective when it comes to evangelism? I believe the answer to this lies in the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus that night. Because the first principle of evangelism we see here is the importance of letting our actions speak first. Look at the first few verses of our reading. John writes, 
Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now Nicodemus was a good man. He was deeply religious and well respected and well educated and a leader in his community. People looked up to him. If anyone in that society should have known God and been close to him, well, it would have been Nicodemus. But Nick saw something in Jesus that was missing from his own life. He saw the things Jesus did. He saw the way Jesus interacted with others. He heard the things Jesus said. And all this led him to the conclusion that Jesus must come from God. He must know God in a way, an intimate way, that he, Nicodemus, didn't. Nicodemus had heard and seen the miracles of Jesus. He saw the compassion, the kindness, and the mercy of Jesus. I mean, Nicodemus had seen plenty of teachers and prophets and so-called messiahs come and go. But there was something about the things that Jesus did and the way he did them that made Nicodemus want to know more. So here's the question for would-be evangelists. Is there anything about your life that prompts people to want to know more? Is the way you're living your life reflecting that you are following Jesus, the Messiah? The way you talk to people in good and bad situations, does that reflect the compassion and the love that Jesus displayed? Do the people you work with and live with, your friends and neighbours, do they know you and encounter you? Do they say to themselves, oh, you know, he or she must have come from God? Because no one has treated me with such kindness before. No one has accepted me or cared for me or served me like that before. I've got to talk to this person. Find out why. Well, this is the conclusion that Nicodemus brought to Jesus that night. Jesus won a hearing by the quality of his life and works. He earned the right to be heard by virtue of his compassion, goodness and power. Now, of course, we're not Jesus. We're not changing water into wine or healing the sick or raising the dead. But we have Jesus in us. And with this, his help, we can bring joy to someone's day. We, even with an unexpected visit or some act of kindness or sacrifice. We probably don't multiply loaves and, and bread to feed all of Hook Norton, but we can provide a home-cooked meal or watch someone's kids when they need to, to go out somewhere or offer somebody a lift to the hospital or whatever it is. We can show acts of kindness. So the first thing all would-be evangelists must learn is that to fulfill the Great Commission involves both proclamation and demonstration. In other words, actions as well as words. Your life should be a beacon and an attraction to others by the way you live it. It's a tough order. We all have bad days. We all feel like snapping occasionally. But we really must give that over to the Lord and help him, help us to stop doing those things. For too long we have thought of evangelism as telling people what they need to hear. But in this text, Jesus reminds us that evangelism is also showing people what they need to see. Nicodemus needed to see a life that was different from any other life, a life that was better than the life he had known to that point. And the people we'd like to reach need to see that in us too. 
You know, most people are shy in front of a microphone. I don't have that problem. They are uncomfortable. And when asked to share a public testimony or their faith, well, shy or not, the fact is we all need to share our testimony all the time. Remember, a literal translation of the Great Commission goes like this. As you go, make disciples of all nations. So it's not telling people who are going out to other countries to make disciples. It's as you go in your daily life, make disciples. So evangelism is not just what you say. It's everything you do as you go through life. And that's harder than delivering a canned evangelistic speech because it's a 24 by 7 thing. I would love to give you a written form of the gospel evangelism in a single sheet that you could say to other people. But you have to earn the right to speak to them by the way you demonstrate Christ in your life. It's the way you live your whole life. Not just here on a Sunday morning, but all the way through the week. You are constantly sharing your testimony of the impact Jesus has had on your life or the lack of it. If we wish to follow Jesus and fulfill our calling, we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds in such a way that our lifestyle and behaviour oozes love and grace like Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, Imitate me as I imitate Christ, 1 Corinthians 4.16. And a second principle we see here is this. We must engage people in real conversation. If you look at this chapter, you see that there is a real give and take, a back and forth between Jesus and Nick. And when Nick comes with his question, Jesus doesn't flip out a copy of Matthew Henry's commentary. He doesn't take out a paper napkin and map out the plan of salvation. He'll eventually get to that because there is time for that. But that's not where our Lord starts. I mean, he doesn't do like many modern-day evangelists do and leap at the chance to deliver some half-baked soundbite. No. What he offers is a conversation starter. Look at how he replied to Nicodemus in verse 3. Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Of course, most of us are very familiar with this expression, born again. But for Nicodemus, it was something that he had never heard before. And as a, view, as a Jew, he valued, treasured even, his physical lineage all the way through from the 12 tribes. The nationality he was born into. But being born again, notice that Jesus intentionally introduced a new way of thinking about faith. Nicodemus was expecting Jesus to say something about keeping the commandments or knowing scripture or offering sacrifices because those are things he'd done all his life. But instead, Jesus talked about a new kind of life, a born again life. The point here is that Jesus doesn't do what many of us do. Turn to the predictable, worn-out, religious clichés in talking to Nicodemus. Nor does he dump the entire gospel message on him at once. No, at this point, all he wants to do is to keep the conversation going and get Nicodemus thinking in new ways about what it means to know God. Paul Borthwick has written a helpful book on this subject entitled Stop Witnessing and Start Loving. And in it he tells the story of a guy he got to know at the gym over a period of months and eventually invited him to have lunch one day. And after a bit of small talk, Paul decided to cut right to the chase. He said, Bill, have you ever heard the message that God loves you and offers you the gift of eternal life? Bill responded, Yes, but could I ask you a couple of questions? Sure, said Paul. So Bill went on. What do you mean by God? 
And what do you mean that, that he loves me? And what do you mean by eternal life? At that point, Paul realised that he needed to slow down and lose the religious jargon. He and Bill just needed to talk for a while to get better acquainted. He needed to listen for a while and find out where Bill was spiritually. And through that, find out what he needed to talk about. The trouble is, we use cliches a lot of the time which are alien in this world. And it's like we're talking in another language. Sharing our faith isn't about delivering a speech or making a sales pitch. It's about entering into conversations with people. It's about listening as, as it is about talking. Nicky Gumbel of the Alpha fame describes how people used to come to faith by listening. Hearing a clear presentation of the gospel in a crusade meeting or a home visit. I'm sure lots of people sat here would have... Uh, um, key into that but now comes to faith come to faith by talking is people air out their doubts and questions in a series of conversations and that's what alpha is about conversations over a meal or a cup of coffee nikki says the best thing that we can do for people is to listen to them to offer them a thought or two and let them talk converse their way to god this is what Jesus did with Nicodemus. If you have one of those red letter Bibles, you see the print go from red to black to red to black. And this means it's a back and forth conversation going on. Question and answer, comment and response. If we were to turn over to chapter 4, we would find a similar thing happened when Jesus entered, uh, encountered a woman at the well. It seems as if John put these two things together near the beginning of his, of his gospel, to provide us with examples of how Jesus typically talked with people about faith. He had a conversation. That should make you feel better about evangelism, yeah? It means you don't have to memorise a lengthy canned speech. You don't have to be able to ask and answer questions. Oh, sorry, you must, you just have to be able to answer uh, uh, the questions that are asked. You have to engage people in a real conversation. And usually it's a series of conversations. Conversations in which you learn to rely on the Holy Spirit when it comes to knowing what to say and when to say it. Why do we have ministries like Stay and Play? and the lunch club. It's so we can have conversations with people. It's not because we're pushing the gospel. Hopefully we're demonstrating the gospel by the way we serve, but it starts the conversation, and hopefully that conversation will grow into people talking their way to God. And here's my final thing. We see here that we should note, and that is to tell God's story. Sharing our faith the way Jesus would share it means letting our actions speak first and then engaging people in real conversations. But sooner or later, we want to get the message over what we call the gospel, the good news that they need to hear. And that's what Jesus does in verse 16. It is perhaps the most loved and familiar verse in the entire Bible. And one I think is I always reflect on when we come to the Lord's Supper. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The gospel in one sentence. Jesus says four things here. Four things he would want us to say should we have the chance to speak for him and tell his story. Firstly, he would want us to tell them about God's love. For God, God so loved the world. Never underestimate the power of those six words. I mean, those words would have caught Nicodemus completely by surprise. He knew that God loved Israel because they were the chosen people. But the idea that God loved everyone, Samaritans, Gentiles, tax collectors, sinners, that would have blown his mind. 
And it's no different today. Many people have no idea that God loves them. They think they're worthless. Some people think they're unlovable. They think that God is either mad at them or oblivious to them. Others have heard that God loves them, but they don't know what it means or, or if it is really true. And that's why it's so important for words and deeds to go together. Many people will not be able to experience God's love until they have experienced it from another person. Someone who accepts them for who they are, cares for them no matter what, helps them or does something good for them. That's why words and deeds go together. Secondly, tell them about Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus. I mean, it's wonderful to know that God loves us, but without Jesus, we would be forever separated from that love. Jesus came to bring God near. Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus died to remove the barrier between sinful man and holy God. Jesus rose to conquer death. There is no gospel without Jesus. So when you get a chance, say something about Jesus. You don't have to tell, them, tell someone everything, but tell them something. Tell them one story from Jesus' life. Tell them something about what Jesus did or said. Tell them to read one of the Gospels. Most importantly, tell them what Jesus means to you. Thirdly, tell them about life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Tell them that eternal life isn't just about life after death. It's that, but it is so much more than that. It's about life that begins today. It's not just limitless life. It's better life. It's abundant life in spite of the problems that come our way. Tell them, if it, if it, tell them it is life the way it was meant to be lived right from the beginning. A life of meaning and purpose and joy. You are allowed to be joyful and smile. I can't tell by the masks. Tell them how knowing Jesus has made your life more abundant and meaningful, more joyful. And people don't know this about God. They think of God as the great killjoy in the sky. They think the Christian life is all about things you're not allowed to do. We need to show them and tell them that life with Christ is the best kind of life available to a human being. It is a truly abundant life, as John quotes in chapter 10, verse 10. Finally, tell them about belief. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. People need to know it's not about good works or going to church or being baptised or knowing the right answers. It's about saying yes to God's love and life. It's about inviting Jesus to forgive you of your sins. It's about asking Jesus to be the master of your life. And so he can make you into the person that you are meant to be. Tell them how you came to believe, and if it feels right, ask them if they're ready to do that themselves. These are the things Jesus would say if he were walking amongst us today. He'd say something about love and his sacrifice and life and belief. But since Jesus isn't here in the flesh, it's up to you and me to be not just the hands and feet of Jesus, but to be his voice as well. So let our actions speak first. Then we engage people in real conversation. And when the time is right, we tell them God's story. We don't have to tell it all at once, and we don't have to close the deal in the first encounter. We just need to say what Jesus would say. 
And the great thing is Jesus didn't give us a job to do without giving us the support we need to do it. Of course, I mean the Holy Spirit. He has sent the Holy Spirit to be, to be our comforter, our helper, our guide. And if we allow him to work with us, we can achieve tremendous, miraculous things for God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Yes. Perhaps you feel powerless and ineffective today. You know you're supposed to share your story, but feel you can't. You're frightened of rejection. Frightened people would think you are some sort of religious nutter. You know, the Holy Spirit has a habit of giving out doses of boldness and courage. All it takes is for us to take the first step. Just like Peter had to step out of the boat to walk on water. That step of faith, Jesus does not set us up to fail. He prepares the ground for us and then prompts us to speak or do. Try it and you'll be amazed. He won't let you down. You'll be amazed at what he can do in and through you. Trust him. Some of you may simply want to bow your head and recommit yourself to be the evangelist God calls all Christians to be. Perhaps God has laid on your heart the name of a friend or a co-worker who is not a Christian and you want to pray for that person. Pray that God would use your actions and words to lead into a conversation that talks them to Jesus. Or maybe you're here understanding your need for Jesus' forgiveness. You feel Jesus is calling you to follow him and to be born again. However God is prompting you, we're going to have a time of reflection as we come to the Lord's Supper. And as we approach that table, feel free to reflect upon these words and call upon the Lord to help you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that John wrote about that encounter with Nicodemus. We thank you, Lord, for the examples you give us of just having a conversation with people who don't know you. Lord, I pray that each one of us would live our lives that demonstrate in our, in our actions and in our words that you are our saviour. And Lord, I pray that when we pluck up courage to start that conversation, that you would guide us by the power of your Holy Spirit to say the words that you want us to save. And Lord, help us to realise that the results are not our responsibility, just our obedience. So help us to be obedient to your promptings in the way that we live our lives, the, the actions and what we do, the things we say. May they all bring glory to you. Amen. Right, as we approach the... Uh, Lord's table, we're going to hear a song, Your Grace is Enough.
brothers and sisters in Christ, it is right that we call to mind the meaning of this supper. It is a remembrance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sin of the world, an encounter with the risen Lord, a feeding on him in faith, a communion with one another in his body, the church, and are looking forward to the day when he will come again. Therefore, we need to come in faith, conscious of our weakness, renouncing our sin, humbly putting our trust in Christ and seeking his grace. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely not I, Lord. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it. And gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Lord, we come to your table trusting in your mercy and not in any goodness of our own. We're not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. But it is your nature always to have mercy, and on that we depend. So feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that we may live, ever live in him, and he in us. In Jesus' name, Amen. We'll retain the bread, well, eat the bread as you receive, and retain the cup as we uh, drink together. There is a Thank you, all my friends. 